Hey everyone, it's Mr. Brian. Surprise, surprise. Got a video coming at you today from my house. Thanks for hanging in there this week. Uh, some good news. Mrs. Brian's made it for, through her first procedure today. Uh, spoke to the surgeon. Everything went well. So um, she's going to go through some tests tomorrow and then on to phase two on Wednesday. And if all goes well, then I could get to pick her up and bring her home Friday. So I'd like to say thank you to all of you out there who had uh, some kind words for me with regards to her surgery. All right. So yesterday you watched uh, an interesting video that I was able to find that I thought would be good to kind of kick off our probability unit. So what I'm doing today is we've got a, a little lesson here we're going to go through and uh, kind of continue on this idea of basic probability, what it means and uh, where we're going with it. So if you haven't done so already in the Google Classroom, you'll see the attachment that has today's notes is two attachments. Uh, one is the notes for today and the other is the assignment that you're going to do. Uh, you'll start it in class and if you don't have enough time to finish it, you'll finish it up tonight for homework. Uh, either way, whenever it gets done, please submit that to me. Um, and as usual, the deadline is 11.59 p.m. Uh, that said, I posted all of the test grades from last week on the parent portal today. So if you haven't seen them yet, take a look. Uh, if uh, you didn't take the test for any reason, make sure that gets done ASAP. And the parent portal is being updated daily. Uh, a few of you out there are falling behind on some of your assignments. So please get on that. Um, get it done before the break because after we get back, at the end of the marking period will be here before you know it. So with that said, we're gonna get things uh, going here for you. Now let's take a look at what we have with our introduction of probability. So getting started, we're gonna talk about random phenomena. And um, so at some points in your notes today, you're gonna to have to add a few things, and this is where we're gonna start. What is random phenomenon? Well, it's when you know what outcomes may occur, but not which particular outcome is going to happen. So it sounds a little complex. It's not too bad though. So let me give you an example. You have a fair die in your hand. You're about to roll it. Well, you certainly know what outcomes may occur. When you roll the die, you could get a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, or a six. But until it actually happens, you don't know which one of those particular outcome are gonna be the result of you rolling the die. So that said, rolling a die is a random phenomenon, okay? I got an even better one for you. How about a little real world scenario? Driving to school every morning. So a lot of you seniors out there drive to school or perhaps you get a ride with one of your friends and you come to the dreaded traffic light on the corner of 25A and Lower Rocky Point Road. Now. Every morning that you go to school, whether you're driving, you ride in a car, ride on a bus, when you get to that light, you know that there's three possible lights that can be on, on the traffic signal. The light could be green, yellow, or red. Now, it's a random phenomenon. And the reason why is you don't know which of those three colors that light will be until you get there. And you can try and time it perfectly every day. You can say, I'm going to leave my house at the same time, or I'm going to stop at Dunkin' and get a cup of coffee. I'm going to leave there at the same time, and I'm still going to get to that light, and it will always be the same color. And it doesn't happen. There's too many other variables in there. We've got a nice random phenomenon there. Okay. So let's say you're interested in what's going on with this traffic light each day, and you decide to start recording the color of the traffic light every morning on your way to school. So let's say that over the first couple of weeks, an overwhelming percentage of the time, the light's red. Every morning, you're getting frustrated. Red light, red light, red light. But then as time passes even further, go beyond those two weeks where you hit a lot of red lights and you hit some greens, a couple of yellows. What you find is the percentage of red lights is gonna go down and approach a number until it stays around that number. And I just made up the number 55%. Uh, let's just say you're a little unlucky. More than half the time when you get to the light, it's red. 
But we're talking about over the long haul, okay, the long time. And when we talk about doing that, we really put things together in terms of what we refer to as the law of large numbers. Now, every time you drive up to this traffic light, this is considered an independent event. Well, let's think about why. It's independent because when you drove up to the traffic light yesterday, and it was either red, yellow, or green, that is not going to influence whether the traffic light is red, yellow, or green today or tomorrow or the next day. Every time you get to that traffic light, it's an independent event. So what is this law of large numbers? So we're saying that we hit a lot of red lights and it seems like things were going south for a while, but then all of a sudden it decreased to around 55%. So what is this law of large numbers? Well, the LLN or the law of large numbers says, as your number of independent trials goes up, so you keep pulling up to this traffic light again, day after day after day after day, over the long run, so we're talking about weeks and months, the relative frequency of repeated events gets closer and closer to some value. So the relative frequency of getting a red light and having to stop got closer and closer to 55%, even though it started at a number that was much higher. Okay. So over time, you settled in around 55%. That doesn't mean it, it hit 55. It fluctuates a little bit, 54, 53, maybe a little bit higher, 56, 57, but it's always around that number. So what happens is your law of large numbers guarantees that relative frequencies settle down. Well, they kind of calm down with their fluctuation in the long run and they approach this value, and that value is the probability of that event happening. And that's where probability comes from. So for our red light scenario, the probability that you get to that traffic signal on the corner of 25A and Lower Rocky Point Road, and the light is red, is the number of times a red light occurs when you got there, remember you were keeping track, divided by the total number of times that you arrive at that traffic light. So in general, we can kind of blow this up for any event. So any general event, which we'll just call capital A, the probability of capital A is the number of times that A occurs over the total number of trials. <clears throat> I also want to get one thing out of the way. I really want to uh, emphasize this. So I'm going to grab my little marker here, my highlighter, do a lot of highlighting. There is no such thing as the law of averages. Don't even say it, the law of averages. It's non-existent. Out in the real world, uh, a lot of people incorrectly believe that if an event has not happened um, a number of times in a row, that the probability of, of it occurring is somehow going to increase or be better because that event is now due to happen. For example, you flip in a nickel and the first seven flips, all heads. And then you turn to your friend, you go, ah, this next one's got to be a, a tail. Tails do. I've got seven heads in a row. Well, that's, that's baloney. doesn't make any sense. The probability of you flipping that coin the next time and getting heads or tails is still 50-50. It could be a head or it could be a tail. There is no law of averages. We see this a lot with sports. Any baseball fans out there, um, you would know. You might hear something like this uh, at a game. Yeah, Mike Trout at the plate has not gotten a hit in his last six plate appearances. But Mike Trout is too good of a hitter. He is due for a hit. Again, that doesn't mean anything. It's just baloney. Sorry to Mike Trout, as good of a hitter as you might be, he's not due anything at all. So if his batting average is 300, that means the probability when he comes up to the plate, that he will get a hit is 30%. It is not affected at all by the fact that he hadn't gotten a hit in the last six times he went to the plate. So we want to get that out of our minds. All right, some probability terms. Let's get through a couple of these, and then we're going to look at some problems together. First up, a trial. What is a trial? A trial is a single attempt of a random phenomenon. Okay, you're going to do something one time, and it's considered a trial. An outcome, 
is your result of whatever that trial is. So you're going to take a look, run through your trial, and say, hey, what happened? That's your outcome, whatever you observed. So here's an example. Let's go back to rolling a fair die. Your actual rolling a fair die is a trial. When you roll it and then you see it land on a five, the five is an outcome. Okay, so there's your difference between a trial and an outcome. Your trial is like the action, the events. What are you doing? The outcome is what do you see after it's already done? Sample space. Uh, this brings us back to your middle school days where sample space is a hot topic in math. Uh, that's when you make a list, a collection of all your possible outcomes. So if we were rolling a fair die, our sample space would be the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. An event. Well, what's an event? That's a combination of two or more outcomes. Uh, an event, probably an event. Let's say we maybe we want the probability that when we roll a fair die, the number is greater than three and even. There's an event. All right, now I think we're ready for some practice. So let's say you've got a piggy bank at home and you haven't been saving much. All you have in your piggy bank is a penny, a nickel, a dime, and a quarter. So you decide you're going to get some money out of your piggy bank. You turn upside down, you start shaking it. And as a coin falls out, you write down its value. So if it's a nickel, you write a five. If it's a quarter, a 25, et cetera. What is a sample space? So remember what we just said. A sample space is the collection of all possible outcomes. So let's think. We have four different coins. Any one of them could fall out. So that means we have to make a list of all of their values. So a sample space is shown with a capital S, an equal sign, and then we use these squiggly brackets and we list all the possible outcomes in there. So here we have our penny, our nickel, our dime, and our quarter. So there's our entire sample space. Now here's an interesting question. Are each of these events equally likely? So is the probability of getting a penny when you dump the piggy bank out equal to the probability of getting a nickel, which is equal to the probability of a dime and equal, equal to the probability of a quarter? So you may be thinking, okay, there's four coins and I have one of each. So each one of them should have a one out of four probability of falling out. Well, that's a very basic approach, and I wouldn't say you're entirely wrong if you're thinking that way. But there's other variables we need to consider. How about the size of the coin, the thickness of the coin, maybe even the weight of the coin? That's going to really determine a lot as you're shaking that piggy bank up and down as far as what coin is going to fall out. So in this case, we're going to say they're probably not equally likely as there are different sizes and different weights, okay? So I'm gonna pause for a minute in case anyone is uh, lagging behind and getting these notes down. Okay, uh, if you guys need to pause this video, if whoever is in the room, substitute, uh, please feel free to jump in and do that. Okay. Practice number two, we had a family which has three children and they record each child's sex in order of birth. Okay. Let's create a sample space. So we're talking about three children and we're talking about the sex when they're born, not gender identification, which happens uh, sometime after a child uh, achieves consciousness of that aspect of their life. So when they're born, we're just talking about biological um, sex. So boys and girls. With that said, we need to think about order. You have three children being born. So let's create a sample space of the possible outcomes. So let's think about this. 
We could have a boy first, a boy second, a boy third. We could have two boys and then a girl. We could have a boy, a girl, and a boy, etc. We could have different combinations. Now, for some of you, the amount of combinations is more than what you would think. For others, it's less. Well, we actually only have eight combinations. Obviously, the Bs are for boys, the Gs are for girls. And remember, these are order specific. So if you have a parent or parents who are having children and they're going to have three of them, these are the possible combinations. So how about the follow-up question? Same as before. Are each of these events equally likely? Well, assuming that it's an equal probability of having a boy or a girl, the answer is yes. You know, we, things would change if um, perhaps the mother-to-be was taking fertility drugs or something along those lines. Um, maybe they're having trouble getting pregnant, et cetera, et cetera. All of those things aside, I think we could feel comfortable saying that each of these events are indeed equally likely. All right. Or another one. How about tossing a coin 10 times? And then you're going to record the length of the longest run of heads. So you get, let's say you flip a coin 10 times in a row. And somewhere in those 10, row, 10 flips, you got five heads in a row. You, all you're going to do is write down the number five. Then you're going to do it again. Flip it 10 times. Maybe you only got two heads in a row as the longest. That's what we're talking about here. That's our trial. So what is the sample space? So if we talk about the length of the longest run of heads, well, out of 10 flips, you get anywhere from zero to 10, right? 10 tosses of a coin, they could all be tails. That means you got zero heads in a row. Then maybe you only got one all the way up to the unlikely event, but still possible of getting 10 heads. Are each of these events equally likely? Now, again, before we jump in and just think that each event has the same probability, let's think about this. Does the probability in 10 toys, tosses of a coin of getting three or four heads, would that be equal to getting 10 heads? The answer is absolutely not. Getting all 10 heads and 10 flips of a coin probably is going to be very small. The numbers in the middle will be much higher. So no, they are not equally likely. All right. So as we begin to wind things down, uh, I just want to throw one other aspect of uh, intro to probability your way. Our old friend, the tree diagrams. Now, tree diagrams can be very useful when trying to determine a sample set. So let's think back to practice number two, which was up here. And practice number two is with the three children being born. How could we put together a, a uh, tree diagram to find our sample space? Well, well, start at the beginning. First baby that's born is two possible outcomes. Those two possible outcomes are a boy or a girl. So that's our first two branches. Okay, so then our first child is born. And if the first child is a boy, the second child may be a boy or a girl. And if the first child was a girl, the second child may be a girl or a boy. Get some more B's and G's floating around here. some theme music here, some tree diagram theme music. That would be pretty awesome. Kind of like a, you know, Mission Impossible. All right, now you've had two boys, you're a parent. Well, next, prob next possibility is a boy and a girl. You had a boy, then a girl. Your third child could be a boy or a girl. You had a girl, then a boy. Your third child could be a boy or a girl. You had a girl, then a girl. Your third child could be a boy or a girl. 
And here we go. Dun, 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 dun. I uh, hope I'm not offending anyone with my completely out of tune noise making. All right, I'll spare you the rest of the Mission Impossible theme song because our tree diagram is done. Now, how does this help us? Well, if you travel down the branches, you come out with the different outcomes. For example, if I start here and I move along the top of all the branches, I hit B, B, B. Then to wind up here at the end of this branch, B, B, G. So really what you're trying to find is what is the path to get me to each one of these final children. This way we'll go B, G, B. So there's another outcome, BGB, and then BGG, BGG. And that takes care of all the possibilities where the first child born is a boy. Now we move down here. How about first born is a girl? We could have a girl, boy, boy. Next branch, girl, boy, girl. Keep going, girl, girl, boy. And finally, all the ladies. You know, have to have some kind of song like that, except they were single ladies. Well, I guess they're single when they're first born, right? All the single babies. There you go. Someone can write a take off of that song, call it All the Single Babies. All right. <clears throat> I'm going to leave you with thinking about all the single babies. And I hope this video is helpful for you all. Um, I wish I was in class, but I'm not. And I'll be back there as soon as I can. So send me any questions via email or throw in the stream, whatever's more comfortable for you. I will get back to you as soon as I can. Um, for the remainder of the period, again, you have a homework assignment, which is also attached in the Google Classroom. You will work on that, finish that up either in class or at home and submit that by 11.59 p.m. tonight. All right. Uh, have a great day, guys. Uh, looks like we're going to get some snow. So get home safe, and I'll talk to you again real soon. Bye-bye.